Every year, some 3,000 young men from all parts of the world, from every section of the United States, converge in a small community on the edge of the Connecticut River in Upper New England. They come to Hanover, New Hampshire to live, work, and learn together as students at Dartmouth College. Each fall, some of this group will be making the trip for the first time. They will have been selected from the thousands of applicants to be members of the freshman class. Dear Mom and Dad, sorry about not writing sooner. It just doesn't seem possible I've been here a week. And yet, this morning at 8, I went to my first class. English 1, Professor McCallum, who looks a lot like Doc Perry next door. Sounds strange, but when he said, Welcome, gentlemen, to English 1, I got a lump in my throat. I thought I was the only one, but maybe not. It was quite an experience, my first college class. My first assignment, my first books. These books you buy form the basis of your own library, but the books for some courses are in the reserve room of Baker, where you sign up to use them for a couple of hours at a time. And on the walls of this room are the murals by the famous Mexican artist, Orozco. At first they knock your eyes out, 
but they stretch from one end of this long room to the other. And when you walk past them every day, you begin to get the story they tell of our civilization. It's an amazing library anyway. Not at all like the libraries at home. Books, of course, but hundreds of thousands of them. And you don't get that suspicious look every time you want to take one out. Quite the opposite. You come and go into the stacks as you please and take right from the shelves all the books that you need. Maybe even more than you need. They take us in small groups, show us how to use the catalogs and brief us on how to find our way around. In the periodical room, where they seem to get everything from life to the mortician's quarterly. I even ran across our gazette. It's a new library, but as you walk through the corridors and look at the portraits of alumni, you get a sense of the past, and you wonder how they must have felt during their first weeks at Dartmouth. Though it's hard to imagine how the place looked in the days of someone like Daniel Webster. After the tour, they figured we should be able to locate any book we might need. Just to make sure, they gave us each a title and turned us loose to try our luck. I didn't have any trouble finding it in the card catalog, but my luck wasn't so good when I got to the directory. It turned out the book would be on the ninth level of the stacks. I'd had quite a climb, but I figured I'd gone that far, so I might as well go all the way to the top. Myself. Better go back to the beginning, arriving in White River Junction on a gray morning a week ago. It was not what you'd expect to find in picturesque old New England, but soon you were on the bus, making the trip five miles north to Hanover. And suddenly there it was, the college itself. We looked forward to this for so long. We'd seen pictures and studied the layout on maps, but you don't really know what it's like until you see it. The bus was met by upperclassmen whom we found out were members of Green Key, and they helped to send us across campus in the right direction. After you've been here a while, I suppose you begin to take it for granted, but that first day, it looked awfully impressive to all of us. Impressive, but at the same time, a little confusing. There were a lot of strange names, and some not so strange. And the buildings, imposing and beautiful, but still unidentified and mysterious, and therefore not quite friendly. When I found my own dormitory, I must say I liked the looks of things around there, But my room, 
Well, you probably know what it's like moving into an unfurnished place. Now I do, too. What you need is a little imagination. The trunks were there, mine and my roommate's. He was still just a name to me, but he showed up about an hour later and we went downtown to buy our freshman caps. I suppose the idea of the caps is to help the class identify itself, but I don't think their popularity could stand the test of a free election, and that goes for the identification badges we wear at first, too. Next, we went to hunt for some items to fill a void in 104 Fairweather. How much you buy depends on your taste and your bankroll. You can do pretty well if you shop around a bit. For a while, it looked as if the whole freshman class had gone into the moving and furnishing business. was no easy job. But after we'd added a few touches here and there, the room was comfortable and looked swell. Maybe not exactly like home, but we like it because we did it ourselves. For music, we get the college broadcasting station. That's in a building across the campus where most of the student organizations have their offices. has picked up since yesterday when the sophomores hit town. But all this activity is a far cry from my first Sunday afternoon. Walking down a strange street wishing there were someone to talk to. I thought I'd met a few people, but suddenly it seemed as if I didn't know a soul. I walked out to the north end of town, past Dick's house, the college infirmary, and finally I realized that I had gone far as the golf course. I walked all the way out to the ski jump. I'd looked forward to skiing, 
and maybe even learning to go off the jump in a year or two. And here was a beautiful autumn day, the kind that should make you feel good. But all I kept wondering, alone up there on top of that weird collection of lumber and steel, was how I ever managed to get so far away from home. I guess you have to feel that way at least once. But later in the afternoon, I met Professor Folger, my faculty advisor. I met him and his wife, that is, along with some other members of my class, one of whom I've been listening to for some time, but didn't meet until later. They tried to make us feel at home, and we had a good time. Mostly social, but part business, too. As the professor took each aside, checked our courses, asked about our plans, and got to know a little about us. Mr. Folger has one of those amazing memories for people and names. And it turned out he remembered Uncle Ted when he was in college. He even pulled out one of the college yearbooks and showed me what Ted used to look like when he was in one of the player shows back in 1924. Mostly, we just got acquainted, though. It's hard to say exactly how it happens, but before the end of this first week, you get to know an awful lot of people, like the fellows your roommate knows who are out for freshman football with him. And the fellows with things to sell, like the senior from Tillamook, Oregon, who tries to sign you up for his laundry service, all the way to President Dickey. Or it may be a bunch of fellows in a pickup football game. One of those where everybody is trying to call plays. And when it's my play, and the ends are supposed to run out for a pass, the whole team runs out instead. And while you're just doing the routine things, like filling out forms, taking tests, being examined by the doctors, there's always someone going through the experience with you. So all the time, you're getting to know more people, beginning to feel a kind of class spirit, becoming part of a group, but not lost in it either. Like this morning, at the start of my first class, when I only knew how important it was to me. Or like now, when I write home to tell you about it. Our first English assignment is to write a brief autobiography. I suppose the professor wants to know about my background, where we live, where we spent our summers, who my friends were. But I can't help feeling the biography ought to begin one week ago, when I arrived in Hanover. Everything past is important, but now I'm on my own, beginning to make my own decisions, finding my own friends, and with all the help the college can give, beginning to shape my own future. 